Our gospel this morning comes from the first chapter of John, and Jesus has been calling his disciples. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked Jesus, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, that you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Nathanael asked Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Those are the words that have been haunting me this week. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What did come out of Nazareth? Who is this man, Jesus, the one said to be the Messiah, the Son of God? Soon enough, in the Gospel of John, Jesus will flip tables in the temple and drive the money changers out with a whip. He will talk about being born from above and accept a cup of water from a Samaritan woman. He will heal on the Sabbath, feed thousands with next to nothing, walk on water, forgive an adulterous woman, call himself bread, light, and vine. He will cry for a dear friend who he will then call forth from his stinking tomb. He will wash his disciples' feet and refuse to answer Pilate's questions, and he'll go to the cross without complaint. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Who decides what's good? The religious authorities, the Roman authorities. Does Jesus qualify as good or is Jesus just a maladjusted Nazarene troublemaker refusing to comply with those who have declared themselves the arbiter of what is right and proper? Here at the dawn of the 20. Second century, is that right? The 22nd century, we watched in shock as insurrectionists storms stormed our nation's Capitol building, and we were devastated to learn that the president had urged them on. We watched in shame and dismay as people carried crosses and flags bearing the name of Jesus into the fray. We now watch as the National Guard assembles to protect Capitol buildings and state houses across the nation. And as we brace for the coming days, people of color and our LGBTQ siblings shudder with familiar trauma as fellow citizens breathe threats and murder against one another because they have been here before. And the church wonders, how do we respond What do we do? We can return to the question about what good could come out of Nazareth and keep our eyes on the maladjusted troublemaker. Tomorrow is is Martin Martin Luther King Day. Speaking at Western Michigan University in 1963, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said this. There are certain technical words within every academic discipline that soon become stereotypes and cliches. Modern psychology has a word that is probably used more than any. It is the word maladjusted. 
This word is the ringing cry to modern child psychology. Certainly, we all want to avoid the maladjusted life. In order to have real adjustment within our personalities, we all want the well-adjusted life. But I say to you, my friends, and this is Dr. King continuing, I say to you, my friends, there are certain things in our nation and in the world about which I am proud to be maladjusted and which I hope all people of goodwill will be maladjusted until the good societies realize. I say very honestly that I never intend to become adjusted to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, leaving millions of God's children smothered in airtight cages of poverty in the midst of an affluent society. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism, to the self-defeating effects of physical violence. And he goes on, I'm convinced that there is a need for a new organization in our world, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment, men and women who will be as maladjusted as the prophet Amos, who in the midst of the injustices of his day could cry out in words that echo across the centuries, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. As maladjusted as Abraham Lincoln, who had the vision to see that this nation would not survive half slave and half free. As maladjusted as Thomas Jefferson, who in the midst of an age amazingly adjusted to slavery, would scratch across the pages of history words lifted to cosmic proportions. We know these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Through such maladjustment, I believe that we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to man into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Jesus was under threat from the very beginning of his ministry because he refused to be anything but maladjusted to the oppression, exclusion, rejection, abuse, neglect, enslavement, and religious complicity with Rome that made life unendurable for, most, for the most vulnerable. Jesus refused to adjust to the boundaries erected between the so-called righteous and the sick, leprous, disabled, or demon-possessed. Jesus refused to adjust to the rejection of Samaritans and Gentiles and women whose choices had been taken from them, leaving them outcast and impoverished. Jesus refused to adjust to the idea that blindness or lameness were caused by sin. Jesus refused to adjust to allowing suffering to continue simply because it was the Sabbath or the sufferer was a Gentile. Because Jesus knew that the established order did not reflect the beloved community, God's dream for all people. Jesus could see that the established order only benefited those who controlled it, those who dammed up the waters of justice and kept the righteousness for themselves. Jesus refused to accept that what God willed for all people, inclusion, dignity, participation, I have to say that again. Jesus refused to accept less than what God willed for all people, inclusion, dignity, participation, respect, food to eat, good health, and the fullness of life that is a foretaste of the kingdom to come. And Jesus never, ever used violence to resist and never called on the name of God to hurt or destroy. Jesus was executed for being maladjusted, for refusing to capitulate. That is what came out of Nazareth. That is what Jesus did. 
What then is the body of Christ to do in the early days of 2021? Do we stay silent because we don't think faith has anything to say to the political realities of our current circumstances? Those who claim a distorted expression of the Christian message are not shy about boldly using the name of Jesus to cause fear and destruction. There is a movement in our nation called white Christian nationalism that tangles up the cross and the name of Jesus with the flag and militarism and privilege, a movement that boldly crosses the line into white supremacy and distorts the gospel beyond recognition with the steady drumbeat of white American exceptionalism. That is the gospel that was present at the Capitol, the so-called gospel banners carried into insurrection. Do we let them have the last word? Do we let that be the clanging symbol symbol echoing across a smoldering landscape? This is not the work of Jesus, and it cannot be the gospel that is proclaimed to an aching nation. It just cannot be because it is not the gospel of life. Friends, I know you wish for Sunday morning worship to be a time of comfort and reassurance, and I am with you. But sometimes the restless spirit reminds us that God spoke through the prophets to say that what God wants more than our worship is our rapt attention to the most vulnerable in our midst. There are times when God wants to light us up with a fiery spirit to break the dams that hold back the waters of justice and to tear down the walls that limit righteousness to a privileged few. We follow a first century Palestinian Jew from Nazareth who refused to let people suffer for the sake of religious peace and harmony. He reminds us that our God demands of us justice, that our God calls us to be repairers of the breach and restorers of the streets to live in, that our God calls us to abandon privilege, to wage peace, to feed the hungry, heal the sick, and bring light to those who have lost hope. The gospel we proclaim is not a gospel that tears down the halls of government, but calls us into the halls of government to advocate for those who are crying out for equality and inclusion, for their piece of the dream that we all share. The name of Jesus is not a banner born into insurrection and war, but a cross emblazoned across our foreheads, emblazoned across our lives, as we, like Jesus, refuse to adjust to systems that privilege some and exclude others, as we refuse to adjust to a sedate form of faith, but instead embrace our baptism of spirit and fire. There are risks that come with following the one who came from Nazareth. There are risks that come with refusing to adjust just as Jesus refused to adjust. And there is life. And not just life for us who live in the promise of this fiery baptism, but in walking with this Nazarene, we follow the one who is life and light for all people. That is the gospel banner we carry into the world without violence, in vibrant peace, with boldness and truth and courage and spirit. We are led by God to work for the gospel of love and hope and light. Be of bold courage, my friends. God is with us. Amen.